Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this PERFORM Colloquium. It is a hybrid event, uh, and so I'm really excited that at least a portion of the audience is here in person, including the speaker. Um, so my name is Karen Lee. I'm a PERFORM member and a member of the psychology department. And today, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Professor Bettina Willison. Professor Willison earned her master's in sports science and PhD in human movement science at the University of Hamburg in 2009, uh, followed up with the postdoc until 2015 and completing her habilitation in uh, 2018 on the topic of cognitive motor interference in older adults. Notably, she established the Department of Health Science within the Faculty of Psychology and Human Movement Science, which now trains roughly 50 students per year in bachelor's and master's programs. Since 2021, she's held the title Professor for Human Movement Science at the University of Hamburg and is an honorary adjunct fellow of Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia. She also serves as vice president of the German Sports Science Research Confederation and she was recently appointed Editor-in-Chief of the German Journal of Exercise and Sport Research. Professor Willison's research program spans both basic and applied questions, with themes such as dual task walking training in older adults and nursing home residents, those with hearing impairments, and also looking into exercise programs for health promotion in um, occupational contexts training spatial orientation in nursing homes as well. And I think we'll hear a bit about that today. She's published several influential reviews on dual task walking training and on individual differences in responsivity to multitask training programs. She recently held a researcher position at the Technical University of Berlin, Germany, working in the mobile brain imaging or Mobi lab with Klaus Gramann's group. So I will stop here because I'm not the person that you came to hear. Um, and I just ask you to join me in warmly welcoming uh, Professor Willison to the podium. Yeah, thank you, Karen, so much for this nice um, introduction and the opportunity for me to talk here today. So um, I would like to give you some impressions about the research of the last 10 years, what I did together with my group, and um, especially what we did in dual task managing training. Um, as Karen said, um, I'm from Hamburg and I mostly work at Hamburg and here you can see how far the distance is. So I came here for the ESPGR conference. And what I wanted to, to show is that Hamburg has a lot of um, comparabilities to, um, to Montreal. And I really love um, this city because um, it's had, I, I, I mean, Montreal, it has so much opportunities and it's so nice um, what you can do here. So here you can see the University of Hamburg and um, on the right there you can see a plan of our um, facilities and um, they are nearly the same as what you can see at the perform center, however, here everything is um, really, really much bigger and you have a lot more opportunities than we have, we have to fight for every hour in the gym to train our participants from the community and to do research. And um, I'm in the human movement and exercise science department. And here you can see some of the, the main measurements and instruments that we use for our research. And we have a lot of things <clears throat> dealing with muscle strength, with um, EMG, with EEG, um, with working performance and balance. And um, this is that you can maybe just see from where I was coming. I was starting as a um, human movement scientist with a lot of biomechanics and then um, I learned much about cognition and aging and so I stepped into this area of research which is the combination of something what you are doing here as well. So the roadmap from a presentation is that I give you a short introduction from the background from where I was started uh, starting my research and then I will tell you something what um, we did for developing the task managing training and afterwards the transfer of the, the things that we found into new 
areas of research and finally some future directions of what we are doing right now um, to get more insights into cognitive motor interference and accompanying neurophysiological correlates and um, mechanisms. So um, I was coming with the idea of reducing falls because falls are a major problem in older adults. And we know that a lot of people who are aged over 65 will have um, at least one fall a year. And uh, the older they get, the more falls um, they have. They might suffer from multiple falls. And <clears throat> a lot of them get um, bone fractures. And in Germany, it's often the start of a nursing home transfer. So they, they will go from the fall directly to the nursing home setting. So, and the common reasons for faults are gait instabilities, um, example from resulting from muscle fatigue. Oops, what's happening? Okay, <clears throat> earlier faults, cognitive decline, of course, and this is the overlapping of uh, the research together with, with Karen. Um, we have also limited visual control and it becomes more and more prominent that also hearing loss will have an effect on um, cognitive motor performance and um, will um, induce the risk for falling. And since yeah, more than 20 years, we try to overcome these problems by trying to conduct exercises to reduce falls, but we are still not there. And um, the, the rate could not be lowered. And this is where I started to, to look, what can we do and what are ma mainly problems that were not um, yeah, researched yet. And when I looked at the daily situation on um, older adults in their, in their environment, when you look at these older women with her dog, um, she might um, have balance and stability problems, and this will lead her to um, more dependency in older age. And we know that postural control, however, is um, yeah, dependent on the movement goals you have, the attentional resources that you can pay, the perception and in turn the coordination of the movement. And so we can say that daily activity can be regarded as a multitasking scenario. And when you have a closer look at these older women with her dog, then she has to hold the dog so she has to hold her stick, she has to react on maybe other pedestrians, she has to walk, she might have these limited visual abilities and she also might have hearing impairments or pain or whatever. And the research on the dual task paradigm might give us more insight on how we can deal with what is happening in this cognitive motor interactions and how we can explain cognitive motor interferences during these kind of situations. And what we know is when we look at research of the dual task paradigm, that older um, adults need a higher amount of cognitive control for their upright posture, and that the increasing um, sensory losses in hearing and vision might also be um, accompanied by cognitive decline. And this will in turn lead to a reduced accuracy in their movements, and they, have, um, they also need more time to conduct their movements. And um, moreover, if they have hearing problems, they have to detect the relevant noise from the surrounding, which might also be um, a challenge. And all together, there will be walking and dual task decrements. And we know that this reduced resource allocation um, increase the risk of falling in older adults. And when we look at especially gait, which is my area of expertise, then we have a lot of things that we can look at. First, we know that gait stability um, is often described in the literature by step length, step width, cadence, and step time. But what we also saw is that the people who are um, walking um, under dual task conditions, they, they change their foot rolling movements. Normally, you start with a heel strike, and then you get your foot rolled up until you get onto your toe. And the people in dual task situation do like this, like walking like a duck. And when you um, when you see like something obstacles like obstacles in your way like this here, when you walk like a duck, then you might duck to the obstacle and then you might slip. And when you do a foot rolling movement, 
and you come to the obstacle, you might roll over the obstacles and you won't spin. So we have to figure out how can we train that the foot rolling movements in the steady situations when you see obstacles um, can be better performed. And this is something what um, I was really interested in. So, and if you compare older and younger people and faller and non-faller, then they show decrement in their walking abilities. And um, the main um, outcome of the dual task condition is that the gait variability increases and the step length is reduced. And this is a problem because the people have to do more effort to stabilize the pelvis over the base of support for each step. And this makes uh, the gait instable. And this is also something that should be trained. And the dual task situation, which demand a lot of attention, like the most complex dual task situation, maybe the situation with a dog or maybe crossing the street, they have the most destabilizing effects, especially for older folder. And this is where I started to see what can we do to overcome this problem. So I wanted to see how can we develop a task managing training to help these older people to reduce their fall risk and to see how we can um, overcome these problems with um, gait instability. First, I looked at all kind of ideas that are behind this cognitive motor interference. So why is um, there a disturbance if you have to do a cognitive and a motor task at the same um, time? And first, we have some ideas about cognitive processing. There is the limited resource hypothesis or the cross com uh, domain competition model by Wiggins, which shows what might happen in the stimulus intake onsets or the modalities. And then you have the task settings. There are some task settings in dual task situation that help you to perform better in walking or to, to hold your balance and others that are really have destabilizing effects. And so the U-shape model by Hoxholt and colleagues is one um, idea how you can explain this. So the task setting plays a crucial role where you, uh, where you have to train for. And then finally, how do you manage the task? So if you have a super postural task, which is something that when you have to hold your balance and you fixate something, when you want to fixate with your eyes, your body can't sway because then you can't fixate. So if you have a fixation task, then the body sway will be reduced and this will be a super postural task and help you to maintain balance. But if you have other tasks that are not um, affording these kind of processes, then you need to see, do I have to prioritize my balance or do I have to prioritize my cognition? What is my goal? And maybe you have to switch between tasks because um, you have to uh, um, see what is standing on a sign on a crowded uh, um, train station or whatever, and you have to see where are the other people, where am I, where I have to go. So the task integration or the task managing strategies are crucial to your balance performance. And there are some ideas about what is happening if you do um, training to improve these kind of, uh, um, yeah, to reduce the cognitive motor interference and um, the plasticity facilitation framework by Harold and colleagues shows that, that you can do a kind of sequential motor training or you can kind do a kind of um, simultaneous co motor cognitive training. And I focus on the right side. So I wanted to see how we can do uh, simultaneous cognitive and motor training to enhance um, cognitive performance. And if you look at the training goals of dual task training, then um, some of the people who do this want to increase the efficiency of the movements or the cognitive resources. Some of the, the studies want to increase um, the plasticity, what you have seen on the, on the slide before, due to several mechanisms that are in there. And um, some of them want to increase the resource allocation, the resource management, and to help the people to um, do all these cognitive processes that are required for multitasking or dual tasking situation. And 
we have to look at the specific cognitive dimensions in the daily movement. So we have executive functions, we have visual memory, we have visual spatial orientation and selective or divided attention. And it depends on what kind of daily tasks you wanna do, how these processes are involved in all these tasks that you are um, conducting. And the cognitive processes in the dual task training um, are also something that we have to consider and we have to think about what kind of information processing is relevant, what kind of goal planning do we need to get through with through our multitasking situation, what are the sub goals and what are the timelines between the different um, tasks you have to do and this is always explained like how to cook a dish. You have to do several interactions to get your meal done at the same time. And this is the same with some um, um, dual task situations and daily activities. And then you have to spend your, resource, your resources on the different parts of your, your schedule for your multitasking. And then you have to integrate your task managing strategies to fulfill whatever you wanna do. So this is, um, what I looked at from the, the cognitive science perspective. But then we have also, as I'm coming from human movement science, we have also relevant training aspects that we have to look at. So we have the ideas of what has to be planned in an exercise session, like intensity, duration, and the type of the exercise, and what kind of training principles that you can find in, in cognitive um, science as well, but um, what kind of specific um, exercise um, aspects has to be integrated. And for, uh, for me, it was especially the specificity, the progression and the, the periodization and programming, which um, were important when conducting the, the dual task management training. And when you look into the literature, what kind of training programs are there to reduce cognitive motor interference, then we have general sports related training like Tai Chi that try to overcome these problems like having a body awareness and see what's going on and um, to control the body movements. Then we have specific motor training when we have balance oriented training or strength training with specific devices. We have a general dual task training where we integrate a mix of balance and dual tasks, uh, for, for example, in false prevention programs. And we have specific dual task training with a dual and a motor task in a specific way with respect to the outcome measurements or goals and a progression, etc. And this is um, yeah, provided by common exercises and more newly also by digital solutions like exergaming. And when you look what you can gain if you put these things together, then if you combine simple motor tasks like walking together with cognitive training, then you enhance cognitive performance. If you do false prevention programs with these general dual tasks, then you will enhance balance and the movements. And if you do this systematically, like if you have the right composition of both tasks and the right progression and everything, then you can enhance motor and cognitive performance at the same time. And this is what I wanted to do. So this is where I started. And if you look at types of cognitive motor training, then you have the specific dual task training with this progression and the increase of complexity then you have this um, general dual task training. And um, I think, and I was inspired by the work of Karen and Louis and um, others, I was thinking about how to include a fixed or a var variable um, focus and how we can include task switching and task prioritization. And you can also, of course, do this by virtual reality training or extra gaming, um, yeah. <clears throat> And when I developed the task managing training, I integrated four aspects. First, I wanted to see how can we improve balance and gait so that we are um, able to free up attentional resources. Then implement tasks that match with the daily life situations, um, the, the strategies and the transfer for, for this management of the task situations. 
and um, how we can switch between tasks or how can we prioritize and make our own planning for the situation. And what is new, I guess, is that I included several strategies that are explained by the instructors in the training. First, something like a visuospatial strategy to um, make sure that the people see all things around the area where, where they are going and performing, because a lot of older adults are always looking something and looking what is coming next, but it's not, they are not overseeing something. And um, when you look at Karen's research, this means that they can only react and they can late react, but they have difficulties in reaction, as I told you in the beginning. So this is not a good strategy. So I needed to learn them to, to oversee and to, to see what's going on and what will happen. Then um, another thing was how can we maintain balance? And um, a lot of people are not aware what they can do if the body is swaying a lot or if they are afraid and have muscle stiffness or whatever. And um, these strategies to um, increase the base of support or to bend the knees to be more flexible to react on something, um, this is uh, something that they really have to learn. And then how can we implement task switching strategies? Um, here are two examples how you can do this. So this was something that was um, explained by the instructors, but also underlaid with the physical performance and the training of the movement according to this. And then we had this um, task prioritization strategies. And I tried to um, yeah, teach that the people should focus on the motor task if they are in challenging situations. But um, the reality is that most of them don't like this and um, that the cognitive task is always more interesting than the, the, the motor task. And so it's a really uh, um, hard way to do this. And during the lessons, they, they agree, but during the testing situations, they don't. So yeah, but um, this is something that um, is really helpful to um, uh, yeah, work through multitasking situations. So the training had two phases. First, I started with the daily um, situation um, with quick walking, starting, stopping, moving around obstacles and everything together with visual and proprioceptive tasks. And um, all these tasks were accompanied by explanations of the instructors. Why is this relevant? What has this to do with your daily life? In which situation do you have to use your strategy? And then in the second phase, the training um, becomes more complex. The dual tasks um, were integrated and um, the, the time pressure or precision movements, et cetera, were integrated into the training to um, get more used to what was going on. And um, of course, the strategies for task prioritization and task switching were learned and um, daily situation of multitasking were imitated. Here you can see what we did um, with some um, people in physiotherapy at Macquarie University, like um, stepping over obstacles while reacting on audio cues, while reacting on sign, as you can see on the left, um, but also like doing a, a stroop task while um, crossing obstacles or reacting on um, perturbations from, from the outside or while, while um, just uh, um, yeah, avoiding to, to crash into other people. And we also included like shopping bags, stair climbing and um, some situations where you have to react on balls and you have to do, do a lot of fun. And what was happening was that the people in Australia asked me if we are designing new party games because, <laughs> because they really liked it and they really wanted to, to join us. And this is something important because the people should maintain what they are doing afterwards. And this is what we see always when we are training groups afterwards we have to, after our research, we have to figure out solutions to um, keep them in the training. So interesting were the effects. So we did um, three randomized controlled trials to see how the, the program is feasible and how it works. 
especially when you compare to strength training, because German health insurances want to um, pay for strength training and force prevention, not for dual task training. So I had to do this and show that it might work. And also I, I talked about fear of falling and I wanted to know if um, people who, are who have fear of falling also can um, benefit from the intervention. So all RCTs followed a single um, blinded randomized trial. We had a progressive task managing training follow the rules by German health insurances to get refunding later on, not for, for the studies. And um, we supported this with like measurements of demographics, et cetera. And um, we captured the um, balance, the, the walking performance with a visual verbal stroop task on a treadmill that allows us to um, analyze spatial temporal gait parameters. And if you look at the results when you compare to a control group, then we have an increased step length, which is good a reduced step width and an improved foot rolling movement. And this is what I had told in the beginning, this duck uh, behavior changed. And this happened under a single and dual task condition with an increased gait stability. And these foot rolling movements, we could show um, with the, the peak plantar pressure and the forces that were first in the midfoot changed to the heel and to, to the toes so that the normal foot rolling movement was uh, mimicked and was better after the training. In comparison to the strength training, we were, um, yeah, we didn't expect that um, the strength training program um, had um, so not so much um, benefits as the task managing training had. The task managing training showed the biggest improvements and both groups had comparable cognitive performance after the training, which was interesting, but we, we measured the cognitive performance under this dual task condition. And as I told you, they are more interested in, in the cognitive task and don't make a mistake in the troop task than in their walking performance. Both programs reduced the fear of falling. And this is the point which is really, um, yeah, has to point it out that the, the strength training group still focused on the cognitive task and that the task managing group was able to focus on both tasks simultaneously and improved their working performance. And this is um, what I really liked in this results. And we look at, if we look at participants with concerns of falling, then we can see at a first glance that these people have um, a worse physical condition in which they start into the programs. Um, but the gait pattern showed the, ex the enhancement caused by the training, which we also saw in the other group. And we had a significantly reduced concern of falling, which was really positive. So we were happy with this results, and then we were able to transfer this idea into new setting. As, and we started with Parkinson persons um, because Parkinson um, people have a different gait pattern and there are a lot of aspects in the gait patterns of people with Parkinson's disease which might benefit from the training intervention, especially when you look at the foot rolling movements, the foot placements and the walking abilities. And so we see, <clears throat> or we try to see how much um, yeah, working capacity can we give to this um, Parkinson patients and how much task complexity of dual tasking while working can we add on? And we did this in a feasibility study and um, we saw that the Parkinson person also improved their working performance, especially in step length and step velocity, uh, in, in gait velocity under dual task condition. But we also faced several problems. First, we thought the main problem might be um, lying in the, the problem of freezes and non freezes and the severity of the Parkinson disease, but this was not the problem. Both groups um, were able to increase their performance, but <clears throat> a lot of, the, of these people um, training session because the task complexity with the dual task managing um, together with this high amount of walking distance were too much. They feel so exhausted um, that they didn't want to come anymore. So we had a problem of finding the right dose for, for these participants. 
And um, we also had the, the problem that they didn't like these um, tasks where they have to concentrate on their fuß rolling movement. They tried to avoid this. They only wanted to, to make these big, large steps over optical obstacles. They were really fast and they were really instable while doing this. And we were afraid of falling. But whenever we wanted to do them, these tasks for the accuracy of the foot um, placements, they, they were a bit like trying to avoid this. So there, there are like some adjustments that have to be done if you want to be really successful with these Parkinson patients. Unfortunately, COVID came and I had to stop this at that stage, but um, I hope that we can go on with this um, yeah, after we passed COVID. And we also transferred the idea into nursing home settings, into programs. And the problem that we have to adjust is that people in nursing homes are faced with multimorbidity and also with a lot of immobility. They need help in their daily activities and they also have a lot of mobility decrements. And um, if they don't get a physical exercise regularly, then they lose their function at a percentage from two to 3% per month. Like every four weeks, they are decreasing in function. And this leads also to a decreased quality of life. So we um, try to face how, how can we adapt this dual task gate performance um, uh, um, training into the setting. And we know that multi-component training, including strengths and coordination and gate and dual task training um, might help. And so we conducted the training in 48 nursing homes and we were able to take in 500 participants. And we aimed for like 800, but also COVID was um, not helping us a lot. And um, when we saw the outcomes of the training, and these are first results because we are still like uh, um, cleaning the data and, and see um, what is there, but first, um, results are that the intervention group really um, benefited from the training. Um, and here you see small amounts of increasements and the, um, the, the statistics that you can observe to this are not coming from the small amount of improvements. They are coming from the decrements of the control group. So we have, were able to maintain the physical performance of four months of the participants who take part in the in the in the intervention, and the others decreased up to ten percent, like um, as you saw in the literature. So you can't um, you can't think that you will really improve a lot of abilities in a nursing home setting, but maintaining cognitive and motor resources are um, really a, um, a success. And um, if you look at fallers and non-fallers, then we again saw the same improvements, but unfortunately, no reduction in the number of falls. So I have to have a closer look on what was going on there. Um, and what is really important for older adults in nursing home settings is the satisfaction with life because they are at the end of their life and they are staying there until their last day. And if we can um, increase their satisfaction with life with an intervention where they are together, where they can socializing and everything, this, this is really good. And um, we saw this in the responses of the nursing home residents that they met people they haven't met before in the, in the, in the uh, lectures, in the, in the sessions. And that they also um, started to make appointments to go together over there and, and just and enjoy what we are doing there. And it was novel that we integrated walking into these sessions. Normally they do seated uh, um, performance. And then we said, okay, but if we improve cognitive and motor resources, why? do we not improve mobility? Why do the people are still sedentary and only go somewhere when there is an appointment or something like this? And so we came up with the next project where we integrated these observations. So we saw these nursing home residents who only walk when they have to, then they have a goal and otherwise they don't. And <clears throat> one thing might um, be that they want to hold on structures 
or that they don't want to lose their orientation and that they are afraid of falling and for some safety reasons. But we also know that if you don't get any cognitive stimulation from your environment, then your cognitive decline will start and turn into a vicious cycle. And so we wanted to overcome this and see what do we have to do to um, get them more active in their facility. And um, maybe um, something is that when you come into a new facility, you are not orientated where you are. You might think a bit and show me with your arm where is the entrance of this building. Can you do this? Just take your arm and show me a direction where is the entrance of this building. Look what happens. Okay, and where is the next bus stop? Okay, you see? The, the orientation where I am in this building where I haven't been before or where, where I'm not used to go a lot of time is really awful. And so we wanted to see, okay, what kind of things you have to recommend um, or look at when you look at spatial orientation in older age. And again, when you look at identification of directions, distances, the navigation through the field, the landmarks that you see on your way and everything um, might be a new area of a new field of dual task research. And so we started with this and tried to see how do we have to adapt our training into a dual task spatial navigation training. So we started um, with the requirements and um, see how um, people um, are liking the new tasks that we conduct. We also looked at um, cognitive training strategies um, that might help to integrate in the program. And then we came up with our new dual task program. So we have six um, tasks. The first one is a floor plan bingo. You get a map of the, the environment um, of where, where you live with all the floors, and then you will be shown a picture. And if you know where it is, then you say here, and then you can put it on your on your map, and then you will have like a uh, bingo if you have like five of these landmarks, right? And to combine this with any movements, they have to stand up, get the picture, and sit down again. So we have a time up and go in, in it. And, and we also ask the questions where where is something like landmark recognition task, we should ask for showing directions. Then something German, hui or fui, it's a German um, pronunciation, it means right or wrong. Um, and you can, you, you see a picture and can say this is in my environment or not. And then a mental journal for orientation through the different floors of the institution. And then we have a gymnastics swing wing and I show you some pictures. So here you can see the people sitting and there are um, pictures on the floor and they are going to grab these pictures and do something with this task. And here you can see the um, gymnastic ring. First, we wanted to use a parachute because this is really nice to have these colors and everything, but we were, we were refused due to COVID. We need to, to um, not to uh, um, pull a lot of air into it. And so we used the gymnastic ring with the terror band and the ball and the people can um, pull if they, they have to use the direction of where is something, like where is the landmark, or they have to, to throw up the ball when they ask on which floor is the hairdresser or on which floor is something, and then they are um, together like throwing up the ball. And also they are walking through their environment. And this is really new because normally they are stuck in the gym. And first the nursing home looked at us like, what are you doing? Why are you? why are you guiding our uh, nursing home residents through the facility? But the German um, word for uh, um, nursing home residents is inhabitants. So they live there. And if they live there, why don't they, should, shouldn't they go through all the facilities? So the, the people really like it, that they can explore their environment. And then they are walking a distance and then at a specific stage, they stop. And then they were asked the pointing task, which I ask you, and then they can say, okay, where is 
the mensa, the entrance, the bus stop, wherever. And then they will get a direct feedback with a correction, like it's there, 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 whatever. And the goal is to um, in, uh, increase egocentric orientation. And the other situation is like they go from some point to another point, and they have to remember what kind of landmarks did I see. And then I don't know you have the same game, but in Germany we have the game, I pack my bag and then I put in my trouser, my skirt, my shoes. And the first one says I put in my trousers, the second one says my shirt, the third my trousers, my third my shoes. And we do this with landmarks. So they have a root learning memory to consolidate their root knowledge through this repetition. So <clears throat> this is how it can be like, like go on and on and on and you can find new situations if you know what you can integrate into this task managing trainings. However, um, for my future research, I still don't know a lot about these dose responses. I told you about the Parkinson people and everything, and we still are struggling with some of these ideas. We also have to look at the frequency of the training and the training load in a certain direction. We have to look how to combine things, especially when we have faller or people with fear of falling, there might be like, like differences, especially individualization might be a problem. Um, we have to look how can we integrate the cognitive training perfectly simultaneously um, and the transfer into daily life. It's, it's observed, but not scientifically. Um, verified. And yeah, I can't give any best recommendations for falls prevention, but I hope I can do it as long as I can work like within the next 20 years. And at the moment, I am um, looking how I can um, get more insights into these mechanisms via um, mobile brain imaging, like looking what can EEG or FNIRS give us more insights. And the idea is that we have this multitasking daily situations and um, if you look at the, the processes of cognitive motor interference, there might be a problem of sensory intake, like of the stimulus response condition. There might be a problem of the resource allocation, or there might be a problem in execution when you look at uh, Parkinson patients. So all these kind of ideas are different steps at the, pro uh, at, at the process of cognitive and motor performance. And um, yeah, I wanna look what is happening there. So in the current research, we are cook looking at standing, walking um, and sitting in different task complexities with mobile brain imaging at the mobile brain lab at Berlin. We are developing a dual task taxonomy, like how can we define and um, structure the, all these dual tasks which are used in the literature. You can find a bunch of them. And um, I'm also looking at um, the effects of um, dual task training in older adults with hearing impairments. We, we learned a lot about um, the, the improvement of the gait quality, especially for pace, rhythm and phase. Um, we reduced fear of falling, we improved dual task strategies, and um, we now want to see how we can do this as a combined hearing and um, walking dual task training or hearing and balance dual task training so that we have specific um, hearing cues on this. And here you can see my dad. Um, he was one of our hearing impaired participants, and this is the big Mobi study where we wanted to, to look at um, the mechanisms and we combine, you can see maybe his earphones, um, he gets tones to discriminate, but he also get visual cues to discriminate to see whether the visual or the, the auditory stimulus makes a difference in the, in the processes and all should be combined into uh, technical solutions, a hearing and balance app where the people can do a uh, um, diagnostic for the hearing and the balance and walking impairments and then targeted to the diagnostic they will give in the, the training task and then they can do the, the training task with the app will get a feedback and this feedback will also be applied to the, the medicine or, or physiotherapist. So my take home messages 
The task managing training can improve walking and performance in healthy older adults and participants with fear of falling. When we have to, or when we want to transfer training into new settings, then we have to do adoptions based on the requirements of the, the targeted population. And um, the specific requirements of falling and belonging task managing strategies um, are now examined um, with, with Mobi. So the future research um, with Mobi will help me to identify more of these mechanisms to improve the training and get it better than it is right now. And here are some of my collaboration partners, but this is not as important as my team. So this is my ongoing team, which helps me um, to conduct all these studies. We have different areas of, of research and some areas are overlapping, some areas are not, but I'm really proud to work with all my um, team members. Yeah, so now I'm at the end. And as long as you don't train, you sometimes have to stop walking while talking. And I'm happy to answer questions. So we have one question from uh, one of the Zoom participants. They said, very interesting work. Sleep researchers have shown gains in procedural motor skills, finger tapping, following a period of sleep versus wake. Do you think the participant's sleep may be a factor to consider in your future paradigm? Um, yes, sleep is an important aspect. Um, one of my PhD students, um, Oliver, here, yeah, um, he um, worked on this in his PhD thesis and figured out that the sleep quality and the sleep duration had a high impact on the, on the cognition. Um, and I guess maybe we have to control about sleep patterns. But the problem is, I guess, that this is, again, something which is individualized. And my sleep pattern might differ from, from other sleep patterns to, to identify which is the right one to have the best performance. So yeah, we should control this. And we also see in the nursing home settings that when we want to train, and um, we do this when the people are fatigued and had a, not a good sleep, etc. then they have less performance than they have when they are, um, when everything was good. So it's hard because sleep is hard to control and I don't have the conditions as you have here at the perform center. As I saw the, the sleep labs, I was really impressed. It would be great to have these opportunities. We don't have it at the moment. Thanks Betty, very, very nice talk. I can see you have a, a huge amount of trials that are launched right now. So you're gonna have a lot of data to come. Uh, <clears throat> I have several questions. I'll just pick up a few. Uh, first one on your uh, trial, the one in the uh, retirement home setting, the uh, pro, pro care. Yeah. Right. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, it was really impressive to see that the MOCA improved, right? And those people were like moderately uh, uh, altered or impacted based on the MOCA, right? So they were demented people. Um, I don't. I don't remember having seen a lot of demented people improving like that. It's one point something, which is very interesting. Do you think if you would have uh, continued that training for a while, you'd have, uh, because some of them would be like six point something, sort of like on the verge of becoming like mild rather than moderate. I mean, it's very significant on a clinical standpoint. What do you think about that? Um, first, I have to say that it was like like a challenge to do the mocha with them. And um, I guess that especially the, the interaction with more people and the testing and all these kind of new uh, um, simulation, simulating stuff was helpful. I don't think that it's a real training effect itself. We have to control for this, but I, I, I won't say that the training is like like a, a global cognitive training. So so I, I can't say this. So I, I think it's the whole setup. And it's also the, the idea that the people are getting more familiar with these talks, tasks, 
and of course counting backwards and naming animals and everything was in the in the dual task uh, um, performance and if they do it in the MOCA so they they do it again what they what they learn so um, I'm not uh, yeah I'm okay. not convinced with like like saying that this is like like a training that improved global okay. competitive um, performance. I would never say that. I guess it's the the whole setup together. My other question um, has to do with baseline. You said you seem to uh, alluded to the fact that baseline performance didn't have any effect or not much of an effect in your trials. There's a lot of studies out there showing that. You know, for example, in Parkinson's patient, a large study published in neurology a couple of months ago showing that people that are uh, exercising on a regular basis, just walking, for example, they slow down the progression of the symptoms. So in other words, people that are training progress slower in the, uh, in the advancement of the disease compared to Parkinson's patient that are sedentary, for example. Um, we also know, and there we have data in my lab on that showing that uh, if people stay active, the intersection between cognition and, and, and motor function are, are less important or maybe reduced compared to those that are not active. So there's a lot of data supporting the fact that baseline is extremely baseline level in terms of activity and in terms of cognitive performance is extremely important. So it's hard to believe that it doesn't impact the training effect. Um, so I, I don't know what's your standpoint. To, yeah, I didn't want to say that it's not um dependent on where you started i would i wanted to say that it's independent of your starting condition that you can improve oh i see so everybody would improve yeah I, right okay yeah i would agree with that yeah and i really I, I i really think that we have to look into the baseline conditions because we have to tailor the training and if i give someone um the right amount of um, distance and cognitive load then he will improve. But if it's not the right fitting, then um, the people might be exhausted or bored and both is not good. So, so we need to figure out how we can individualize what we are doing there. And at a certain stage, and this is what we did in ProCare, we did a progression for some of the participants, what we had some other participants that had to stay on the same level. So it was really tricky um, to, to do this. And we were there with two people running the classes to, um, to do this because we needed to, to differentiate between the, the improvements of yeah, the people. Very, very resource depending, but it's yeah. probably the way to go. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, impressive talk. Thank you and, very much. Yeah, maybe I can add another thing um, which we discussed, um, like, some of the people, when they start uh, um, a dual task measurement, have dual task costs. Some of them don't, and some of them improve. And so we have to also look what is the, the reason for um, the, the dual task performance at baseline. So this is another um, tricky point that we have to look at. Okay, so at the center where I work, the Performance Center, I've noticed that some of the seniors that came back, um, when they came back, they had difficulty communicating. So they would start communicating, and then they would stop, there would be a long pause, they would continue talking. So it seemed like there was cognitive processing issues. Um, and then over time, through conversations and just being in the environment, uh, the cognitive processing seemed to improve in the sense that they could have conversations, they could express themselves, they could walk better, etc. So I'm just curious, like the dual tasking is, could it be, could conversations be a dual task, like exercising and talking to a trainer, would that be dual tasking in itself? Because I know dual tasking is generally, okay, count backwards, uh, you know, you know, or name animals or play games, but we have trainers like student trainers, interns that work with seniors and they help train them. So they talk the whole time. I'm just wondering, is that considered dual tasking in our environment? Um, I guess it is dual tasking. And this is also what the Münster group did when they do their driving um, uh, um, studies. They, they hold up uh, uh, emotionally conversation to see what's going on then when you do this. And um, yes, um, I guess it is, 
but then you have to like look at what do you want to improve so if you want to improve conversation and walking, then you do conversation and walking. I'm not a friend of these kind of counting backwards things. This is another story. So um, <clears throat> I, I would never do counting backwards in my dual task managing training. The, the people do react on signs. They, they react on additional um, cues. They do hearing tasks, like what you, what you see in your environment. They don't count backwards because they, they would never count backwards when they cross the street. Why should they? So <clears throat> I'm not doing this. And um, yeah, if you are uh, aware of what processes are needing for talking, then you do this. And if you are um, aware of what processes are needing to react on signs, then you do this. And then you put in what is required for the person who you want to help. And for example, um, I was training um, people after stroke. And I did the, the walking performance with them, the gait training. And some of these stroke people, if you talk to them, um, about like appointments and something like this, why they do their walking task, they don't know this anymore. So I had the problem with my participants that when I did the walking um, training with them, when I came back the next day and said, yeah, we have an appointment today, it's physiotherapy. Mm -hmm. They said, no, you never said that. And I was like, oh yeah, but we talked yesterday while we were walking. So, so sometimes this might be the training that you should induce. Thank you so much for your presentations. Really, really interesting. Um, I'm just curious for your Parkinson's cohort. I know you said you didn't like it didn't because of COVID. It's kind of like on ice. But what was the average age of the participants? I'm just curious. Uh, it was 65 in average. Okay. And what was what was their baseline physical activity level? Do you have that data? Um, no. No, no, not for that study. Okay. So um, they were like giving us to the ambulatory center of the clinic okay. and they were like chosen by their medication and their, their, their um, severity of the, the Parkinson's disease. Okay. Um, but yeah, I think it's um, really um, worse to control the baseline mm -hmm. activity before. Okay. And then like for the severity of Parkinson's, was it like mild, like or like, you know, newly diagnosed or was it like they had a they, they were about four to six years within their disease. Okay. Okay. So people that maybe have learned to manage a little bit the disease yeah. but are progressing. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Thank you. We have an online we have an online question. Um, so wonderful presentation. In rehabilitation, we have been focused a great deal on using dual task interference during motor learning with older adults, less talking while learning. By introducing graded dual task interference to improve processing, but in very naturalistic conversations to introduce variability for more flexible, flexible adaptive skills, not count backwards tasks. Very interesting to think of this in terms of contextual interference during tax, task practice. Very thoughtful, provoking presentation. I guess more of a comment. <laughs> Thank you. I was listening. Where's the question? Yeah. <laughs> Can I ask the last question then? Um, okay. Oh my gosh, you want me to press the button and stand at the same time. Okay. Um, thank you so much. That was just like a very, very thought provoking and inspiring presentation. So my question, I guess maybe, I don't know how to solve this problem. And uh, I think you've probably given that you're in nursing homes and have this very impressive sample size across so many nursing homes that there, there are some tricks of the trade that you've picked up in terms of getting buy-in from the staff who are working in these facilities and the management of the human resources in these facilities. When I have spent time in nursing homes, I see, you know, people have their jobs and they have X number of minutes and each resident is supposed to receive X number of minutes per week of physical therapy, let's say. And so 
what are your thoughts about how um, one could promote like this kind of wayfinding that I think is, is so wonderful to promote in increasing people's sense of place and their sense of identity and, and personhood, which is so often taken away in those settings. Yeah. So it would be great if everyone in a nursing home would have like a specific amount of physical activity guided by a, a physiotherapist per week. It's not the, the, the thing in Germany. You don't have this. So it's organized by the nursing homes or not. And in the nursing homes, you have to work together with the people who are caring for what they are doing the whole day, like um, how do you call it? Is it a specific German word called Beschäftigungstherapie? Do you understand this? It's like it's like um, they have specific people who have to organize all the tasks that the people are doing per day, like playing games, like going to the hairdresser, like everything. Yeah. And they have to organize what, what they are doing. And they also um, take people from the outside for, for exercises. And um, sometimes they have a, a therapist for, for these daily activities. And if a nursing home has this, then it's easy because these people are on, on our line and they help to integrate this and they really want to do this. But if they don't have, then it's a long journey. Yes, yeah, something like this, yeah. So as much as I, I hate to bring this to a close, because I think it's just been such an interesting talk and, and discussion, um, I want to just make sure we, we properly thank our, our speaker for a wonderful talk. And um, thank you, everybody, for coming. And thank you for those who have joined us online. Uh, very much appreciated. And if there are any questions, follow-up questions, would it be OK for us to contact you by email? Yeah, of course. OK. All right. Thank you right, so much. You want. Right, whatever we want. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. It was a pleasure.